She has worked on large scale teacher development projects for over a decade in the areas of training, monitoring, and evaluation and project design. She loves the creative process of writing, teaching, and training materials and has written content for self access, face to face, and online delivery. Thank you so much, Ipali, for joining today. Welcome to this webinar. Just before we move to the webinar, I'll quickly share the norms for the day. One, given the large audience that we have, like I shared in the beginning, please keep your video off and mic off to reduce the stress on bandwidth. Unmute it only if our speaker is asking us to do so. Second, keep a pen and a paper with you or any note-taking device to ensure that we're taking notes and we're learning and we're ensuring that what we're learning will stay with us even after this webinar, because we might forget what we have learned. Also, you can keep typing your questions in the chat box. I'll be there to curate all your questions. And with the time that we have, we'll be asking those questions to our speaker today. This is both on the Zoom chat and the YouTube chat. Again, remember that you know learning new things might be a little difficult, a little challenging, especially in an online format. And hence, ensure that you speak to your peers or colleagues after this and discuss like how we can apply what we learned here in your classroom or in your teaching practices. This webinar will also be recorded and will be available on YouTube and Fricky website very soon. This brings me to the end of my introduction. Again, is this like a thing on one of the very exciting parts of the webinar for me personally. Before we move to the webinar, we'll do a quick opening activity. What we are going to do is we'll all switch on our mic. This is one chance for us to all speak together. And when I say go, all of you, please say hello in your mother tongue. This will also help us understand the diversity in this group. People who have already attended this webinar might know this structure, but it's also great to know who all are joining in this webinar today. Okay, so when I say go, please say hello in your mother tongue. Ready? One, two, three, go. Namaste. 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 Namaskar, Mandi. Namaste. Namaste. Namaskar, Mandi. Namaskar, Mandi. Namaskar, Mandi. Thank you so much, everyone. We heard, I think, multiple languages. That also tells us the diversity of this group. With that, I'm handing out a speaker today. Dipali, over to you. Thank you so much, Ali. Thank you for the introduction. And hello and good afternoon, everyone. I just want to, first of all, address uh, a change uh, in today's uh, topic and also address the comment that is in the chat. Yes, the initial topic for today's webinar was uh, first generation learners, uh, uh, wasn't an instruction to first generation learners. Uh, however, uh, the speaker uh, who was assigned for today was, was not able to make it. So I've stepped in and I thought I would share an area uh, that is particularly interesting to me, but also one that I uh, have uh, expertise in. Uh, so, um, you know, with, in consultation with the Firki team, we agreed that we would change the topic uh, to the current one, which is from teaching to writing materials. So I just wanted to uh, kind of address that at the very beginning. Of course, we would love to have you stay on for the rest of the session. But if you feel that this uh, topic is not relevant to you, uh, you are more than welcome to uh, leave and join us for the next session on the 22nd of December. Uh, also to note that the topic of that one also is uh, different from the one that we have uh, on the list. And I will tell you more about that later. Uh, right, so I'm going to share my screen now and uh, take you through the presentation, of course, and the session. I think you can see uh, my screen now. I'm just starting the presentation. Right, please give me a second. I'm just going to put it in presenter view so that I can see the notes. So as Ellie mentioned, my name is Deepali Dharmaraj and I'm assistant director academic, which means I lead on the academic aspects of our project and writing materials is one of the areas that I lead on and I have been working on for the past about 10 years now. Um, just a, a quick kind of um, alert before I go ahead. 
Uh, I can't really see the chat uh, very easily. So I'm going to try and do pull that up now on my screen, just in case there's something. Um, yeah. OK, uh, so I can see that there's no, there are no uh, comments at the moment. Uh, so the content for today, I've put together from a course that I co-authored in 2016. Uh, it's a British Council course, and we run it on our teacher development projects. And I've used elements of that course. The name of the course is Developing Skills in Materials Writing and Adaptation. So I've kind of taken elements from that course as well as from my uh, own experience and I've put together this presentation. So uh, there's quite a bit of uh, theory and theoretical references, uh, but of course I've tried to make it as practical as possible. So the learning outcomes of this uh, webinar are for you to be able to define teaching and learning materials identify to better be able to of course uh, i i want to reiterate that it doesn't mean that you don't know anything about writing learning materials and of course you'll see from the survey that 68 people responded to uh, many of you have already said that you're very good at writing materials so you know it's it's this is a question of a matter of being better able to do something you will be able to identify the quality better be able to identify the qualities of good teaching and learning materials, uh, evaluate materials effectively, identify the stages of a learning cycle, explore the process and stages of designing activities, and finally, create more effective learning outcome statements for your materials. Uh, in my personal opinion, writing learning outcomes um, is, I would say, it's, the, it's one of the key factors in ensuring that your materials are fit for purpose and that they've been written um, in a manner that really caters to what is being taught and the learners themselves. Uh, so this is the overview. I've broken up the session into three main sections. The first section will look at teaching and learning materials. The second second section will uh, look at um, the learning cycle. And the third section will look at learning outcomes. Uh, this is also in response to uh, some uh, comments on the survey, which I will take you to now. So I'm just going to share the survey as it is. Um, please let me know if you can see it on your screen. It should be just loading now. We can see a slide that says results from the survey as of now. Okay. Not the results as such. Okay, okay, thanks. I'll, thank you so much for letting me know. I'll stop sharing the screen now and I'll share. Right, so can you see this now? The results of the survey? Yes, now we can see the response. Fantastic. So yeah, thank you. Yeah. That's right. Great. Thank you. So as you can see on your screen, I received a total of 74 uh, responses. Thank you so much to everybody who took the time to respond to this. You've also given your names, but I'm not going to uh, focus on those because we don't have permission from everybody to share names. Um, uh, when asked, do you, um, how do you design your lessons currently? There is an equal split, as you can see, between those who say that they adapt the lesson, uh, textbook lesson, and those who write their own materials. Only three of you have said that you teach straight from the textbook. Uh, the next question was, what needs, skills, gaps, or challenges would you like to see addressed in this uh, training? And it was very interesting. Uh, many of you had um, activities for online classes, et cetera, but that's, unfortunately, we're not going to be addressing that. Uh, but just with relevance to this uh, session, how to make content effective, especially to uh, include storytelling. So we will, I'll show you the principles that we use in writing materials in the British Council and those that I, I personally use. And you can see how you can adapt that, them to different 
topics and subjects. So if you are teaching mathematics, for example, if you're teaching, if you're, you know, an English teacher and you want to use it for storytelling, etc., they are just principles that you can apply. So the focus of application is uh, entirely up to you. Uh, lesson planning topics also, we won't really cover topics as such, but we will look at uh, planning an overall session or a lesson uh, using the learning cycle. Right. Um, and then uh, we, I asked you a question. Uh, please check the box that represents where you are today. I think I missed one question, sorry. There was one question, how do you intend to apply? I don't know why it's not yeah, here. How do you intend to apply your learning in your current uh, role? Uh, so of course, this uh, question is more for you to think about how you can come to the session and take what you're learning uh, back to your classroom or your training room. Uh, and someone says, I will give uh, practical examples based on the topics and organize a virtual tour of the respective topic. Uh, that's interesting. Um, practice them in class. Yes, please do. Would like help in building confidence to com come forward and take the challenge. I hope that this helps you gain more confidence. Um, I teach language to older students. I want to create engaging and challenging sessions that help the students learn. Uh, engaging the children in the process by using real life examples. So thank you very much for all your responses and I hope that you will find the session uh, useful. Uh, so a lot of the uh, design of the session was determined by your responses to the survey. Many of you have said that you either agree or strongly agree that you can uh, describe a learning cycle. So I'm going to ask you about that in the session uh, going forward. Uh, you can design your own activities. You can adapt materials effectively for your learners, and you can effectively evaluate materials for your learners. So taking um, the, a cue from the fact that you already have a lot of experience in writing materials, I've designed the session in such a way that I hope it will up uh, your skills a little bit in ensuring that you're able to uh, do so more effectively. I'm going to now go back to my presentation. Right, so can you see this on your screen? Teaching and learning materials? Yeah, we can see that. Thank you so much. Right. So when it comes to defining teaching and learning materials, here's a good um, definition that will help us uh, kind of put it into a structure for this session. So teaching and learning materials is a spectrum of educational materials that teachers can use in the classroom to support specific learning objectives as set out in le uh, lesson plans. So I'm not, this is not a session about lesson planning. I just want to clarify. It's about writing materials that can contribute to lesson plans. So it's taking one step back, really. And then when, when you have your materials in place, then from there, you can cull out either lesson plans or lesson activities or uh, several lessons. Uh, I also want to state before uh, going further that a lot of my experience, especially in the recent years, has been in writing teacher development materials, so uh, materials for teachers and teacher trainers. So uh, some of the examples that I'll be using today will be taken from the materials that I have written for teachers and teacher trainers. So what's involved in materials writing? If you look on your screen, you can see some words and terms. Are there any terms there that you don't know what they mean? I'll give you a second to look at that. Right, so CLIL is content and language integrated learning. This is when a subject is and language are taught together. So for example, uh, teaching science in English or teaching science in Telugu where you're teaching the subject and you're teaching a language. Now, please bear in mind this 
this is used when the language is not the learner's first language. So if it was me, for example, Telugu is not my first language and I was learning science in Telugu, then it would be clear. EAP is English for academic purposes. So for example, if I want to study abroad, uh, you know, study further education uh, and I need to learn how to write um, uh, assignments and essays uh, and I'm trained and taught to do that, that is English for academic purposes. ESP is English for specific purposes. So English for nursing, English for pilots, uh, that is ESP. So when you think about writing materials, there are all these, these various things that you have to think about. Who am I writing it for? What is the context that I'm writing it in? Uh, are there any reference materials that I need? Am I preparing my students for an exam? Like, I, am I pre preparing them for, um, uh, you know, uh, say IELTS or something like that? Did someone say LAC? I can't see LAC. Yeah, Dava has mentioned LAC. Okay, I'm not sure I can see it on the screen. Have I missed something? Um, it's a last chat. No, I. But it's not on the on. It's not on the uh, slide, right? LAC no, no. is not mentioned on the slide. It's on the chat. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so is it going to, am I going to be teaching online? Is it self-study? What kind of material is it? So these are all the things that we need to bear in mind when we are writing materials and we are, when we are thinking about moving from a teacher's perspective to a materials writer perspective. Usually as a teacher, all we think about is either the syllab, not all we think about, but very often we tend to think about writing materials as just how can I complete my syllabus or how can I prepare myself for my students for the exams. But there are lots of other factors also that you need to consider when writing materials. Right, so what, from your experience, what do you think makes good materials? Can you put it in the chat, please? So you can see some pointers on your screen, layout, relevance, logical flow. What are the other factors that contribute to good materials writing or good materials? What makes good materials? When you think of materials, you can also think about a, a textbook. So what do you think makes a good textbook? Very good, yes. Engaging, relevance, yes. Small chunks, very interesting, yes. Simple to understand, yes. Realistic, yes, very good. I think realistic also uh, relates to, uh, you know, the relevance with the context. So it should be realistic for the students to understand, but it should also be realistically achievable. Activity-based, learner-friendly, fantastic, thank you connecting with real life. Concepts are clear and related to their life. Accompanied by illustrations. Yes, exactly. Lots of visuals. Very good. Give a chance to talk. Yes. Right. Thank you so much for your responses. So some uh, qualities of uh, good teaching and learning materials uh, that I have found in my experience, they should meet the learner's needs. They should meet teacher's needs. So they should be able to support the teacher in the teaching process. They should build on prior knowledge. They should help learners to develop confidence. Uh, if you're familiar with the self-determination theory by Ryan and Desi, you will know that the three areas that they look at is competence, uh, which is related to confidence, autonomy, that is being able to do it alone, and relevance. How relevant is the content to my own, uh, my own background and where I'm coming from? Uh, they are based on sound theoretical principles. So there has to be an element of theory that has uh, been woven into the materials. They take into account learner differences. They achieve impact. They help learners to achieve the learning outcomes of the course. 
They engage effectively uh, and cognitively, engage learners, sorry, effectively and cognitively. They maintain their interest. They are easy to use. I think as a teacher, uh, it's very important to have materials that are just easy to use and pick up. They flow in a logical order. I had already mentioned this. They have clear instructions for the teacher and the learner. One of the things that I feel is really important in writing materials is uh, if the teacher for example, does it either is unavailable or doesn't have the skills, the material should be so easy that learners can follow it on their own. Of course, I'm not of my primary learners, but secondary learners or adult learners should be able to follow materials on their own. And of course, it should uh, encourage learner autonomy. And a couple of other points. So these are just some uh, aspects uh, when we're looking at good teaching and learning materials, just some aspects that we need to bear in mind. Now, writing materials is one thing, but another important aspect is to evaluate materials. And the reason why I'm bringing this here is because when we write materials, we need to start thinking about evaluation right from the beginning. So this is a little bit of a squiggly uh, diagram, but um, essentially it shows, this, this is from Ian McGrath, and it shows that um, materials should be evaluated in a cyclical and continuous uh, manner. So if you look at the bright blue boxes, this is pre-use, in use and post use. So the three times that you would evaluate materials. So when you evaluate materials and how do you evaluate them? You can use evaluation checklists. It can be a simple yes, no, to some extent, et cetera. So you can think about all the qualities that we mentioned before, put that in a checklist, make a table, yes, no, to some extent, tick. Uh, that is a way of evaluating materials. And there are three times that you would do it. Before you use them, you would look at the general impression. So is it really something that, you know, does it look good? Does it have a logical flow? Is the layout pleasing to the eyes, etc.? And then you think about, is there possibilities for later, uh, deeper comprehension? So once the materials are used, can they be stretched? Can they be, you know, can they be, uh, can learning become deeper? The next area is in use, right? So in use is done in two ways, through regular reflection and in-depth analysis. And then finally, post-use. So after you have used the materials, then you would look at whether they have achieved learning outcomes, uh, what are the results of the exams uh, as a, due to having used these materials, and can you get some opinions from teacher and learner? Can you get some feedback? Can you do a focus group? Can you ask people for their input on the materials? So before you design materials, before you write materials, whether it's a lesson plan or whether it's a series of lesson plans, or if you're planning to write a textbook, think about these three aspects or phases of uh, evaluation of materials. And what are the areas that you will evaluate them in? Right, we're moving to the next uh, section of this. I'm just taking a quick stock of time. Uh, we're moving to the next section, which is the learning cycle. Now, many of you said that you know what the learning cycle is. So can you please in the chat box, or if you want to unmute yourself, you can. Can you tell me what the learning cycle is? Or give me examples of the learning cycle. Okay, it is to generate inquiry. Yes, it's a way a child learns. It's a way, in fact, anybody learns. Uh, you know, you can use the learning cycle for adults also. Right, someone has said inquiry cycle. Can you elaborate that? What is an inquiry cycle? Understand, remember, analytic, okay. Fantastic, Bhavna. The process of uh, awareness of a topic from understanding and implementation of the topic to, in life. 
Very good. From unknown to known. Okay. Transfer of learning from teachers to learners and the process the teacher also learns. Fantastic. Because that is from construction to co-construction. Because construction is where the learners construct knowledge. Co-construction is when the teacher is also reflecting and constructing their own knowledge. Okay. Thank you very much for your responses. So here is the learning, a learning cycle, I have to say. There are many, 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 many different types of learning cycles. This is what we use in the British Council. So as you can see that there are five phases or stages of the learning cycle. They're written on top in a jumbled manner. Can you tell me what one, two, three, four, and five are? So for example, what do you think one is? You can put it in the chat box, one, and you can write what you think that should be. Very good, that's correct. Yes, one is learning objectives. What is two? Okay, very good, Bhavna. Yes, Bhavna is correct. Two is lead in. Three. Three is input and feedback. Very good, Bhavna, again. Four is, I think many of you have already written that in the chat. Four is action plan, that's correct. And five is, of course, the last one, reflection. Thank you very much, uh, well done. So a learning cycle is a concept of how people learn from experience. That's basically the most, the simplest kind of form of a definition of the learning cycle. A learning cycle will have a number of stages or phases, the last of which can be followed by the first. So that's why it's a cycle. So I'll just take you forward to the next slide, which gives the answers. So you start with learning objectives, then you have a lead in, you have input and feedback. And of course, feedback in this case means how you and your participants will apply their learning. That is the feedback. That, that's the meaning of feedback here reflection and action plan, or you can have action plan and reflection. It, you can switch those two uh, stages. It doesn't, there's, it's not fixed, set in stone. Here are three different learning cycles. So there's A, B, and C. You can see these um, different uh, diagrams on your screen, visuals on your screen. One is, uh, you need to match the diagram, the visual, with the description. So a course comprising a series of topics which must be taken in a stated order so that the previous learning is built upon. Each of these topics has a number of lessons which may have an assignment attached to them. So which uh, visual is that? A, B, or C? Okay. Uh, yes, the answer is C. The next one, a series of lessons which may or may not be connected. Which one is that? A series of lessons which may or may not be connected. Yes, that's correct, it's A. And finally, of course, B is learning the same topic over a number of months or years. So this is the spiral approach. Uh, somebody had already mentioned that in the chat. So B is the spiral approach where you just take one topic. Initially, it's very simple. So say in grade one, if the topic is on animals, uh, children would le just learn the difference between domestic and farm animals. In grade two, they'd learn a little bit more. In grade three, they'd learn a little bit more, but they would continue to learn about animals. It would just be that their, uh, the sphere of learning would get bigger and bigger and bigger. So that's an example of the spiral type of learning. So here are the answers, A, uh, C, sorry, A and B. So C is of course this one here, where there are uh, a series of topics which must be taken in a stated order. So there are many separate topics, they may be connected to each other. And um, A is a series of lessons which may or may not be connected. And B is the same topic which is taught over many times. All of these are examples of learning cycles. And within each of these, in the minute sense and the individual sense, they will follow that cycle of learning objectives, uh, then lead in, then input, 
you can have many levels of input. So you can have input, 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 and then you can go to reflection and action plan or action plan and reflection. Here's one uh, more example of a learning cycle. As educators, you must be very, very familiar with this. This is Cole's uh, learning cycle. I'll just give you a couple of minutes to read the text on the screen. I mean, not a couple of minutes, a minute. <laughs> So you can see here that David A. Kolb's uh, cycle uh, is usually, it's called a, the reflective cycle also. It starts with concrete experience. If you want a starting point, it starts with concrete ex uh, experience. Then it goes to reflective observation. You think about the experience, abstract con conceptualization. You think about what you can do differently. What other avenues can you follow? You try out that, which is the active experimentation um, stage, and then you go back to concrete experience. Now, if you were to look at the two, um, these two um, continuums, uh, he calls this the processing continuum, and this is called the perception continuum. And these form the basis of individualized styles of learning. So if you look at this first one here, accommodative, uh, these are feel and do. These are the kind of people who like hands-on and rely on intuition rather than logic. These people use other people's analysis and prefer to take a practical and experiential approach. They are attracted to new challenges and experiences and to carrying out plans. So this is just how you can individualize or customize your uh, materials to suit your learners. If you know that your learners are feel and do, then this is where you can begin. You can begin with active experimentation and then start the cycle there. This is the beautiful thing about Kolb's uh, reflective cycle and indeed many learning cycles. You can start from anywhere uh, in, this particular, uh, in this particular manner. Uh, the next one is divergent, this one here. Uh, these people are feel and watch. They are able to look at things from, a diff from different perspectives. They are sensitive. They prefer to watch rather than do, tending to gather information and use imagination to solve problems. They are best at viewing concrete uh, situations from different viewpoints. Then the next you have a simulative. They are think and watch. So these people require good, uh, clear explanation rather than practical opportunities. They excel at understanding wide ranging information and organizing it in a clear, logical manner. And finally, you have convergent, uh, that is think and do. People with a converging learning style can uh, solve problems and will use their learning to find solutions to practical issues. They prefer technical tasks and are less concerned with people and interpersonal aspects. So the, uh, the, what is the purpose of this? The purpose is that educators should ensure that activities are designed and carried out in ways that offer each learner the chance to engage in materials as a, uh, as a way of, uh, in a manner that best suits them. Right. So I'm going to move on here now and look at an example from one of our materials, British Council materials that looks at the uh, learning cycle and uh, the, you know, the whole aspect of writing materials in one chunk. So the topic of this session, this is a teacher training session. It's a 90 minute module called How Children Learn. And it's designed for, yes, you can use it for a single subject, definitely Swaradha. So I hope I've pronounced your name correctly. Uh, so this top, this session that I'm going to describe is a 90 minute module for teacher training. It's called How Children Learn. Uh, the first thing you will see, of course, are the learning outcomes. So the learning outcomes of this session were to describe the behavior of children and understand how to, they can manage it in the classroom, to identify different ways in which children learn, 
to list and discuss three learning styles, auditory, kinesthetic, and uh, visual. Of course, this is now a debunked theory, so we don't use this uh, particular thing anymore, but I just wanted an example for you. Uh, and to use a variety of ways to motivate learners in English lessons. So this is the learning outcomes of this teacher training module. What are the domains of learning? Of course, you may have, as educators, learned about domains of learning, the three domains, which is cognitive, psychomotor, and affective. I'm not going to go into them in this session because that's not uh, the focus of the topic. But it also describes what the domains of learning for this session will be for teachers. And then when you look at the learning cycle, you can see that uh, learning objectives have not been included because they can be included as uh, learning outcomes also. So what was the lead in for this session? The lead in was uh, participants were given this question, what are children like as learners? And they had to brainstorm. So in this, through this activity, uh, we were uh, accessing the prior knowledge of teachers when it came to how children learn. So that was the topic of the session. And then there were one, two, three, five activities which were input activities. One was how children learn, the second one was how you teach. The third one was motivation is important. The fourth one was a demonstration lesson. And the fifth one was let's look into the, te in the textbook, which was essentially looking at a textbook lesson and then adapting that using the principles that they had learned in this uh, session. So there were five input activities. Then there was feedback, thinking about how participants could relate the session uh, to their learners, and then reflection and action plan where they had to think about what they had learned, what they found challenging, etc. And then they had to make an action plan using a template. So of course, there were materials that went with this, there was a participant workbook, etc. But this just gives you an idea of how we uh, wrote um, an entire module using the learning cycle. So um, he, the you know module is one thing. When you look at input activities, how do you design those input activities? So I've got some steps here for you. I'd like you to put them in order. So which one will come first? A, B, C, D, E, F. Will it be A? Will it be D? Will it be B? Can you please put that in the chat? These are the steps that are involved in designing activities when we write materials. Which one do you think will come first? Which is the question that you would ask yourselves first? Okay, some people say A. Very good. Uh, yes, Amina is correct. Why are the teachers uh, trainer, sorry, trainees or learners doing this activity? That's the first question that you must answer, right? Can you now put the rest in order? So D is number one. What would be two, three, et cetera? What would come next? Why are le trainees and learners doing the activity? What would be the next logical question? Okay, what do they need to learn? Okay. Do you think C would come so early or do you think C should come later? Okay, D, A, E. Okay, let me pull up the answers. Okay, so it's D, A, E, F or B. Thank you very much, Arpita and uh, Arti. F or B and then C. So C would come at the end. But also I would argue that you need to give them an example or a demonstration of something that looks successful. Um, so this is just an example of the questions that you need to ask when you are designing an activity. And wh what do I mean by activity? I mean by anything that would come in the input phase of the session. 
Uh, I'm just getting a quick check on time. So I have another five minutes. Right, sorry. Uh, I'm just going to skip this uh, because I don't want to uh, take too much time and uh, come to learning outcomes. So, so far we've looked at describing what teaching learning materials are. We've looked at the learning cycle. We've looked at five different examples of the learning cycle. We looked at one that starts with learning objectives, et cetera. And then we've looked at uh, what the learning cycle, how the learning cycle can be used in practice. Now let's look at learning outcomes. So here is an example of learning outcomes. By the end of the session, that is, you say when it must be done, when must something be done, the participants, that is who must do it, will be better able to write clear, achievable learning outcomes for their own context. So that is what they must do. So when you're writing learning outcomes, they must have these three elements when, who, and what. Uh, so those are the three components of writing learning outcomes. So I'm just going to give you a minute to read through the bottom, the text at the bottom, which describes what learning outcomes are and um, why you know it's important to write them carefully. So the main purpose of learning outcomes, uh, in my opinion, is that they should be so clear that both the learner and the teacher or anyone looking at those materials knows exactly what is being achieved and how it can be measured. So how can you measure that this uh, particular session was a success? You will just look and see if the uh, participants are able to write clear, achievable learning outcomes. What would be clear and achievable outcomes? They would be smart. So they would be specific, they would be measurable, they would be achievable, realistic, and time bound. So that's just a way of uh, ensuring learning outcomes, ensure that your materials are written not just for the participants or the learners, but also uh, ensure that you know what is being achieved. I just want to say one very quick thing, and it's in the notes of the slides when you, uh, you know, you can always, they, these will be shared with you. But in the notes section, please, if you, uh, you know, can take some time to read that, uh, you must share your learning outcomes with the participants or the uh, participants or your learners. You, you know, I wouldn't ever hide learning outcomes because it's important for everybody to see what they are learning. And of course, the go-to uh, kind of guide for writing learning outcomes. Uh, are you all, I'm sure you all are familiar with this. What is another way of um, looking at it? It's in the <laughs> it's in the source, but this is from lower order to higher order thinking skills. What is it also called? Bloom's. Very good. Yes, this is Bloom's taxonomy where you start with remember, understand, apply, analyze, evaluate, and create. So you're moving from lower order thinking skills to higher order thinking skills. So I've put together for you a list of uh, verbs that you can use when you are writing learning outcomes. So <clears throat> starting from remembering, which is a lower order thinking skill, and going to creating. So you can look at how you can, uh, when you write materials, use these verbs to uh, identify what your learners or your participants are going to be able to do. So if you look back at the learning outcomes, I'm just going to uh, skip back to the learning outcomes of this session. Right. 
Right. So can you tell me, can you uh, uh, tell me what kind of uh, overall, are there mostly lots or hots um, verbs used from Bloom's taxonomy? So define, is it a lower order thinking skill or is it a higher order thinking skill? Yes. What about identify the qualities? Yeah, identify is kind of somewhere in, I don't say it's a, moving more towards lower. What about evaluating materials effectively? Where is that? Yes, evaluating is in the middle. Identify again is a lower order. What about explore the process and stages of designing activities? Explore, what kind of verb is that? Right, and create. Right, so here's a very quick task for you. Can you write any one learning outcome in the uh, chat that uses a verb from the higher order thinking skill? I'm going to pull up that slide for you. So take any one verb. This is what happens when you add animation to your slide. It takes forever to change. I'm just gonna very quickly skip to the slide. I'd like to, you to write one learning outcome. So just like I showed you here, by the end of the session, the participants will be better able to write clear achievable learning outcomes for their own context. Can you select any verb from either evaluating or creating, that is a higher order thinking skills and write a learning outcome for your learners in the chat, please. Okay, I don't want you to give me just the verb. I'd like you to write the full learning outcome, the full sentence. So by the end of the lesson, my learners will be a better able to generate, I don't know, five, whatever. Thank you, Arti, fantastic. The process of synthesis, a excellent. Explain the process of synthesis. Fantastic, well done. Okay, I'd like you to have a look at Arti's example, please. It's really excellent. Okay, I'll just wait for one more to come in because I'm conscious that we need to keep a little bit of time for question and answer also. Device questions. Okay, very good. Maybe to make it a little more uh, specific, you can say in what context. So what kind of questions? Are you saying WH questions, closed-ended questions, open-ended questions, etc.? The students must be able to comprehend. Wow, lots of responses are coming in. The participants will be able to take the process of writing creative piece and making final product to evaluate. Well done. Well done, thank you so much. That's excellent, really good uh, examples coming through. And of course, when you are writing uh, materials, oops, don't forget to evaluate, don't forget McGrath's um, process of uh, pre-use, in-use and post-use. Uh, evaluate the materials that you write. Uh, don't forget, so we covered various things. We looked at teaching learning materials, we looked at um, the learning cycle, how you have the learning objectives, a lead-in, input, you can have multiple input and feedback. Then you have your reflection and action plan or action plan and reflection. Uh, we also looked at the uh, Corp's uh, learning uh, cycle, reflection cycle that uh, looked at a more deeper kind of individualized uh, uh, approach to teaching and learning. Don't forget to evaluate how they are going because uh, in my experience, I found that looking at materials, seeing how they are being delivered in the classroom, 
seeing what activities are dysfunctional, what activities when you're writing an activity, you think, oh, this is going to work fabulously. And when you look at it in the classroom, it doesn't work at all. Uh, so it's that ability to go back and revise and adapt your materials over and over and over. So thank you very much. Please put your questions in the chat. I'll be happy to uh, try and answer them. Uh, these are the references. The one uh, that I've highlighted in yellow is available for free download, and it's a really good resource. I've used it to develop this uh, content. It is a no-nonsense guide to writing, writing materials. It's uh, written by English language teaching writers, but it's, I think it is relevant for most teachers. Uh, so it's available at this uh, link. And of course, you'll have the PowerPoint presentation as a PDF, so you can also access it on your own. Right, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Dipali, for that. We have around three more questions and I'm requesting participants to type in the chat box if you have any other questions. We have a few questions from YouTube chat too. Uh, first question is by Ruchi Mittal. So she's asking if you have a class of mixed learners, how would you decide where to begin? Well, I'd first do uh, like, a, like the survey that I did, do some sort of a needs analysis, uh, find out what the, it's difficult to strike the balance between individualized learning and teaching for everybody. So I would, yes, I would definitely look at differentiation, but I would also look at what do my learners overall need to learn. And then uh, each activity can be differentiated uh, to suit your learners depending on their needs. It's a slightly connected question, the next one from Suman. Uh, how can syllabus be taken hand in hand for children with special needs? That's a very good question. I'm not a special needs expert actually, so I don't know, let me just see from my own experience. Um, I think differentiation is one way of uh, adapting materials to suit learners. But I think also it's important to know what kind of special needs uh, you know, are, that you have in the classroom. And you might need to bring in expertise uh, to support you. Uh, I think very, very often, uh, I mean, I completely believe that teachers are superheroes, <laughs> but also teachers are not superheroes. We can't do it all. And if there are some special needs that require a very specific type of instructions, then I think uh, you know, there needs to be an expert to help you do that. Flipped learning is also a good way of ensuring that you differentiate. So basically flipped learning is you send participants or uh, students the text beforehand or tasks beforehand. And then the classroom activity or classroom time is used only to get feedback on those tasks or to stretch those tasks further. So you also introduce them to the uh, text beforehand rather than in class. Makes sense. Um, there's another question. So it's slightly, I think, very specific question. Uh, Rajshree is asking, should we share the learning outcomes with every lesson or with every unit? What is the frequency in which we should share that? There's no real, I mean, there's no uh, fixed uh, like rule of thumb. Uh, if it is a new topic, I would say, then you must share the learning outcomes in every new topic. But if your lesson is a carryover or a completion of the previous one, I would just continue and then, but I would always refer to the learning outcomes. I think it's very important to refer to whether it's at the beginning or at the end, you must refer to the learning outcomes because there's that concept of visible learning, right? Your learners should know what they are learning. Rather, it's not hidden secret knowledge. Um, yeah. So we have one question from Dava. So will you explain how language competency is relevant to science learning? How important is it? Uh, in my experience, uh, when the medium of instruction, uh, it depends on the medium of instruction. So if you're looking at uh, English as being the medium of instruction, then I would take a CLIL approach where there is a content and language integrated learning kind of framework that supports learning. But if you are using the learner's own language to teach science, then of course they develop competency in that language. 
So, uh, you know, I think it just depends on the medium of instruction that is being used. The question doesn't talk about English, so I'm not sure. Yeah. So again, depends on the language which you use as the medium of instruction. Yeah. Um, there is a question from Arun Kumar. Is it necessary to make know our learning outcomes to le learners and why exactly would that be this important? Yes, so I just talked about the concept of visible learning, right? You know, the concept that uh, learners should be able to, what they see is what they get. Um, I believe that it's important to let learners know, not just so that there's, uh, there's a transparent kind of uh, teaching and learning, but also so that they are able to self-assess. So if you go back to this session, can you list the qualities of good teaching learning materials? You should be able to say that for yourself rather than tell me as a trainer. So I think that is the benefit of sharing learning outcomes with learners so that they are also able to self-assess and see how they are doing. Of course, this depends on the, uh, on the uh, level of your learner, right? Because primary learners, you don't need to put it in such technical language for them. You know, you could simplify learning outcomes. But I do think that all learners, so you might have a different uh, text written in your lesson plan, but there may be a different, you may communicate it differently to your primary learners. Whatever way you communicate it, I believe learning outcomes must be communicated to learners. Got it, got it, makes sense. Um, so man has another question. It's also connected to slightly children with special needs. So if you're planning a project-based activity, how can we do well with students who are slow learners or have difficulty like maybe dyslexia or something like that? Right, okay. So I just, uh, from my own years in uh, teaching and training, I have a pet peeve against the word, uh, for the word slow learners. I believe that all children can learn, all learners can learn, but yes, there are special needs. So there are needs that students have that are special. Um, so just to answer that question, I think grouping learners uh, where you have a balance of different skills and different uh, learning preferences in a group will help towards project-based, uh, will help your project-based teaching and learning, you know, grouping them because you as a teacher, you know which learners are, a, are you know, which are, what are their strengths and what are their areas of development. So putting them in groups cleverly will ensure that your projects are, uh, you know, managed well. Um, we have one last question. It's from Mariam. Can you please throw some light on adult learning materials? Uh, yes, I mean, my entire section was on adult learning materials because that's my uh, area of expertise. Uh, I'm a teacher trainer at heart and absolutely love it. Um, so I'm not sure what kind of uh, light, but I do think that uh, with adult learners, there are two key things. One is that you must establish credibility with your adult learners. You must uh, you know, they will not, uh, primary, children will take you as the uh, fountain of knowledge because that is the perceived kind of, uh, you know, expectation of a teacher. But with adult learners, it's not that easy. That's one thing, so establish credibility. And secondly, I would say draw from their experiences much more than you would for, learn, for uh, children. Uh, so those are the two things that I would say are key to uh, teaching or training adults. Perfect. Thank you so much, Nepali, for your time. We would really like to thank you for being generous with your expertise and time. I request you to share your experience on this webinar. Like, what do you think? How was it? How did it go? I've absolutely loved it. Thank you so much, Ellie. I wasn't expecting to uh, be, I did a webinar in April. I wasn't expecting to do another one, but I love it. I love working with you all. And uh, I mean, the participation from the 
uh, I mean, participants was absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much, everybody. It's always so gratifying as a trainer when you are uh, speaking to uh, in, an, in an online session. You don't know if people are listening to you. Know you know you could be sitting at your kitchen table doing something completely different uh, while you're here, but you're paying attention. You're responding. You're answering the questions. So I'm just uh, completely uh, in awe and very very grateful for your participation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that, Ali. Like I, that's something you totally agree with. All the webinars that we have conducted, it's something I've also observed. Like participants, our users are very, very interactive. And there's any question posed on the chat box, suddenly you can see the chat box is moving up with all the responses and such good questions they ask. Thank you so much, participants, for the active participation. Please continue to do so. That's why I think you can all learn from each other because I think even in chat people are also responding to each other. They were also answering. Yes. Yeah becomes a learning community in that way. Yes. Thank you so yes. much, everyone. Uh, our next webinar as part of the Learning Path Teaching in Action is scheduled to take place on December 22nd on getting students communicating. So please do look for Fitki emails in your inbox for information on this upcoming webinar. Also, before you leave, please give us feedback. The link for the feedback form is also based on the chat box. This will help us understand what we have done well and what we need to do better to give you better experiences going forward. Again, to reach out to a speaker after the webinar, please write to teachenglish.india at britishcouncil.org and please follow at teachindia on Twitter and at teachenglish in India on Facebook for more updates. <clears throat> this information will all be pasted very shortly on the chat box. Thank you so much, everyone. Also, please follow Firki at Firki Portal on Insta, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter for regular updates. Have a great evening, everyone. See you soon on the next webinar. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm just going to put a very quick um, uh, explanation of our next uh, webinar uh, in the chat. Thanks, everyone. Perfect. Bye. Stay safe. Bye.